All right, so we're online. Hello, everybody who is already watching. We just need a couple of more minutes, I think. I'm going to give a brief introduction, maybe in German first. Hallo, alle miteinander. Ähm, Martina Morga und ich werden heute eine kleine Video-Lecture darbieten. Ähm, das sind Ausschnitte aus einem Konzept, das ich geschrieben habe und versuche, als Projekt gefördert zu bekommen, über den Blick der Kamera im Film. Und ähm, wir haben das umgeschrieben zu dieser Video-Lecture, die wir euch heute zeigen möchten. Ähm, die Lecture wird auf Englisch stattfinden. Ich hoffe, das ist okay für alle. Und aus diesem Grund werde ich die Introduction noch mal kurz in englischer Sprache machen. Hello, everyone. <lacht> um, it's great that you're already here. Uh, Martina Morga and me, Lucas Serbst, will present to you an, a, video, a video lecture. Um, these are excerpts from a um, proposal that I'm trying to get funded as a uh, live video project for next year. And um, it revolves around uh, the view of the camera. And we, we put it together to this uh, video lecture. All right, um, if we are ready. Hello. I guess, without further ado, Let's start from the beginning. Imagine you are watching a film. First shot, wrinkles, flesh. Slowly the skin moves upwards, revealing the close-up of a human eye. And it stares right into the camera. It blinks once or twice, before the picture blends into the total shot of a brick wall. Moments later, a person appears in front of that wall, dressed in a big black coat, hiding their entire face with a piece of cloth. With their back pointing towards us, they run in panic away along the wall. Who is this person running from? Being is being perceived. Apparently, this sentence was a great inspiration for the poet who wrote the script for this film. They even incorporated this into the first lines. It is a quotation of Irish philosopher George Berkeley. As many of, this fellow, as many of his fellows in the area of enlightenment, he worried about the foundations of self-consciousness. Being is constituted by the ones looking. Or, to put it into the words of a much younger Sartre, the gaze can create and kill its opponent. And here we sit and gaze on this person being haunted by an invisible enemy that somehow happens to be materialized by the camera. Let's pause this film for a minute and give some thoughts to the point of view the camera has. As we sit here together, generations X, Y, Z combined, We've grown into a genuine understanding, got familiar with the camera perspective. Without the need to be too technical about it, we already understand that a camera is a simple tool used to capture a scene. Since we all carry one in our pockets at all times, it's not far-fetched to imagine such thing being present on a film set, probably in a much larger scale, but basically the same. Also, traditional cinema used to be tremendously ambitious about hiding the presence of the camera. The widespread thinking was, and is, that incorporating the presence of the camera into a scene would destroy the perfect illusion of the performed fiction. Therefore, it's not our fault. We were unconsciously trained to be genuinely familiar with the camera, and yet it is always there. Imagine, again, we are watching a film. There is a camera hunting down a person in a black coat, and they are scared to death. 
They're escaping the gate. They're escaping the dangerous gaze of the camera. Some filmmakers decide to consciously address the camera. You might have heard of it. They call it breaking the fourth wall. And it works like this. Depending on the scene, this is set to be perceived as an intimate connection between the character in the movie and the audience. It is often used to expose the film as a fictive production. The character bodies up with the viewer, standing outside the fictional narrative in the film. Are we looking at each other? I don't know. Montage is the key element of visual storytelling. We can create spaces and spatial relationships that are merely fictional. Our mind combines these pictures into one causal coherence. Where were we? Well, somebody was running away from the camera. Let's see what happens next. The person bumps into a couple. Couple is shocked. The man picks up his lorgnon. That's what he likes to call his fancy glasses. He looks in the direction the other person was headed, looks at the woman, remember this, he looks like he's about to say something, the woman pushes him, they both turn their heads towards the camera and boom, they faint. Remember, you're watching a film. What do you see? Is it a four inch screen? 13 inch or? even a 15-inch screen. Behind these windows that we open on a daily basis, we encounter the compression of a fiberglass-covered reality. We encounter familiar bodies behind unfamiliar avatars, as if the OLED screen light reveals a far more vivid version of reality. Beyond the endless possibilities in creating as many alter egos as wanted, lies the mere incapability of depicting life as it is. Therefore, it didn't take long for a trusty old misnomer to reappear. Authenticity. We want to believe that there are spaces in our lives driven by genuine effect and emotions, something outside of mere consumer culture. On social media, authenticity became much less a sociological phenomenon as a cinematic device. What appears authentic on the internet is awakening desire for a lifestyle, a mindset that cannot exist in reality. The understanding of truth and genuineness that we normally would have taken as a given gives now the impression that we would have forgotten how to truly live. The segregation in authentic and non-authentic doesn't introduce more truth to our lives, but increases the doubt on reality. Karl Wiemer wrote a beautiful essay on digital aesthetic, proclaiming that there is no such thing. Everything that we perceive as so-called digital art is experienced by using analog technology. He would argue that everything of modern technology we use on a daily basis, Zoom, social media, Twitch, etc. Therefore, might in the end be a continuation of... What was the last film you watched? Where did the person go? Did they manage to escape? Fast forward. The person locks himself up in an apartment, but he knows he isn't safe. The camera is with him because it's her gaze who can create or kill its opponent. There is a prominent essay in feminist literature by Laura Mulvey. She wrote it in the 70s. Visual pleasure and narrative cinema. Highly recommend. I'm going to put it onto the reading list for this course. In a world ordered by sexual imbalance, pleasure in looking has been split between active male and passive female. The determining male gaze projects his fantasies on a female figure which is styled accordingly. 
In this essay, Malvey coined the term male gaze, proclaiming that traditional cinema, especially Hollywood cinema, has structurally reproduced and maintained a gap between men and women by providing pictures that put male characters into a active position and female figures into a passive position. As a feminist writer, she takes a glance at psychoanalysis and uses it as a tool for her argumentation. Women are the ones who like to be looked at and men are the ones who are looking. Laura Malvey explains the gap between men and women which is transported through cinema as continuation of stereotypical heteronormative erotic images. This is what she calls visual pleasure. In psychoanalytic slang, they call it scopophilia. The woman in cinema is an indispensable element, yet only to embody the notion of wanting to be watched by men. The female hero, Malvey quotes Bud Butcher here, triggers love or fear in the male hero. Besides that, she has no meaning whatsoever. She is the threat of castration in the cancellation of subjects on the screen. Men cope with this threat by demystifying the woman, depreciating her, saving her or punishing her. Leaving out a lot and jumping right to the conclusion where Mulvey names three kinds of views in traditional cinema. The one of the camera that depicts the scene, the one of the audience who watches the result, and the one of the characters amongst each other. Do you remember we were watching a film? Malvey goes on. Jacques Lacan has described how the moment when a child recognizes its own image in the mirror is crucial for the constitution of the ego. Quite apart from the extraneous similarities between screen and mirror, the framing of the human form in its surroundings, for instance, the cinema has structures of fascination strong enough to allow temporary loss of the ego while simultaneously reinforcing the ego. The sense of forgetting the world as to who has subsequently become to perceive it, I forgot who I am and where I was, is nostalgic, nostalgically reminiscent of that pre-subjective moment of image recognition. The person is covering up objects in the room. Often the camera approaches and tries to get a glimpse of their face, but never succeeds. Then, finally, their gazes meet. Oh, Lord, it was Buster Keaton all along. He stares right into the camera, shocked of what he sees. After this painful escape, he finally seems to have recognized himself. And that leads to his ultimate death and the end of this film. Furthermore, we see that the character seems to be blind on one eye. Just like the camera, as we now have learned, they are only able to see with one eye, the male eye to be precise, and they all might be blind on the other, or better to say, the other eyes. When Samuel Beckett wrote this film, he had a very precise imagination about how everything should take place. He even determined the angle the camera should be shooting the running person from. However, in the original script, the woman has the fancy lorgnon and the man has only his princessness. It shouldn't surprise us anymore that the woman was taken the opportunity to actively look there. Are we active lookers? Are we aware of the fact that we are watching a film? At one point, Malvey writes, at the same time, the cinema has distinguished itself in the production of ego ideals as expressed in particular in the star system, the stars centering both screen presence and screen story as they act out a complex process of likeness and difference. It is worth remembering another essay written by George W. S. Trow in the 1980s. Weirdly enough, the New Yorker dedicated almost a full issue on his thinking, which is a sentence I stole from the internet. Trow thought of TV audience on two layers, two social networks, if you will, and he called them grids. The viewer is living on the grid of intimacy, the direct and physical one-to-one -one connection between two persons in real life, and on the grid 
of 200 million, the collective body of TV watchers. According to Tro, there used to be a huge gap between these two grids that we filled out with pre-digested food from the television. Celebrities, talk shows, gossip, blah, 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 blah. This is so interesting. I'm also going to put this onto the reading list. Nowadays, we live in a permanent media spectacle. All of this isn't new to us. And any Zoom meeting might be the mere continuation of film history with its cinematic devices, stereotypes, conventions. However, where are the 15 minutes of fame that Andy Warhol promised to us? You're acting weird when a camera is pointed at you. Authenticity is a top seller on the internet, but you cannot buy it on Amazon or eBay. The more aware we become of the fact that we're constantly acting in a global public, the more professional we become about it. We find a comfort in it. For the cost of authenticity, how did it become so natural to be a micro-celebrity nowadays? Who are the heroes and who is the audience? And how does our film end? Will we find out the truth in every selfie that we ever took with our smartphones? Will it be Buster Keaton with an eye patch? Or will it be us who encounter ourselves?